This is our family boat that we originally got in 2008. So that was great. For a few years there, we had a family boat and we'll do boat things like driving around in it. And that was all great. So what happened to this boat? Well, the year was 2013 and we're out in the boat doing our boat yeah. things. Boats. And we see this snorkeler waving for help. <laughs> and we're like, oh, better go help him. We speed over there and we arrive at the snorkeler who's waving about. Turns out he's just waving at his mate. Man, did you see the shells and stuff? I totally saw so much shells and sand. Yeah, and the, and the sand too, so much sand. Lots of sand. Lots of sand. Man, we're out stupidly far with no dive flag or boat. Yeah. Let's go back under and then come back up and frantically wave at each other. Yeah. Shit, let's go under shells, sand. Sand and shells, go under. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> and didn't need any help. Turned around, noticed the engine was steaming. That's f***ed. And the engine never restarted again. After we drifted over to a sandbar, I had to walk the boat all the way back to the boat ramp. And then it was sitting in our driveway for many years. So today's video is a little bit different. I kind of say that at the start of a lot of videos, but this is just a bit of a summary of a boat build project that I've been doing over the last, since 2014. So a fair few years. So the goal with this project wasn't to do like a nice show and shine type restoration of an old boat. It was just to get the boat back up and running and safe with a newer engine. So after the outboard suffered its steamy death, at first we thought we'd fix the motor, but pretty soon after it happened, my brother managed to find a later model engine, which was a 90 horsepower Yamaha. So a newer, more reliable engine, and it came with a free pallet and an old car tire. Deal. However, the boat then sat outside with the new outboard next to it for the next 10 years. Now, what are we working with here? Well, the hull itself is kind of obscure. It's a late 1970s Durban. In Western Australia in the 1970s, lots of people realised they liked the water, so then lots of random companies popped up to have a crack at building fibreglass boats around that time. So the hull itself has definitely seen better days. It's pretty much just become a storage shelf for previous YouTube video projects like the Rapid Array Rat Trap there and some old sticks. It's been fairly banged around in the past, but it's not too bad. Pretty much everything needs a little bit of attention on it. There's nothing too serious though, apart from it not having a motor to make it go forward. But on the scale of floating ocean debris to swimming pontoon, it's definitely up there in the swimming pontoon range. For moving the pontoon around, the trailer had a fair bit of rust in places, but nothing to make it structurally unsafe. At some point, the skids on the trailer have broken off and that's caused a bit of damage to the bottom of the boat. You know, it's still skids, but it's more like what your knees do on bitumen if you fall off your bike. So for the inside of the boat, at some point while the boat was outside, I installed all the gauges and wiring, but then I was like, working under the summer sun under the bow of the boat kinda sucks. So I left it all in a big mess and figured I should finish building the shed first. Otherwise, the bilge pump has been tucking into some beers in its downtime. The upholstery is pretty good though, if you like a dead, dry reptile skin feel. We thought we'd check on the fuel level. Yep, full tank of iron oxide. It's so bad. <laughs> it's come off now. Oh, sh Despite the sticker in the boat clearly labelling what an isolated danger marker looks like, at some point, it looks like someone's hit an isolated danger, which has torn a big f off hole in the bottom of the hull. But to be honest, I'm not completely sure how this has come about, but I suspect it's part of an ongoing problem where the boat runs off the rollers when retrieving it, which has then hit the steel bracket tearing a hole. If you have any suggestions on ways I can prevent this, definitely let me know in the comments because I still haven't worked out a good solution for this. So this was the first job to tick off, just to make sure the hull was okay and it wasn't a big waste of time putting a new motor on it. First I ground the fiberglass back around the hull and just cleaned it up a bit. I also drilled a hole in the deck to put an inspection camera down there just to make sure everything was okay. I then resealed it up internally, then reprofiled the shape on the bottom of the hull with some fiberglass reinforced porridge, then added a stack of layers of both woven and stranded fiberglass matting. Repairs like this can be done neater, but I plan to refinish this whole section of the hull in the future anyway. 
But working like this absolutely sucks. You're constantly fighting gravity, drips of resin are trying to reinforce your hair and stuff. While I worked on the upside down gooey bird's nest, my father-in-law sanded and recoated other areas of the hull that needed attention. I didn't get much footage of this part, but my son did. I guess daddy's been doing more grass. Fiberglass, you know? That stuff is not fiberglass, that's water. Non-professional fiberglass jobs are generally a frantic effort as you have limited supply of resin on hand and it all goes off so quickly, especially working in the heat. Yeah, My I mean, daddy's more, having a little bit of trouble the, um, here. That... Yeah, he'll yeah, be alright. At one point we lost a pot of the flow coat, probably because I mixed it wrong. Overall it was hot crappy work but we got there in the end. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great, yeah. yeah. Right. Oh yeah! Okay? Oh, I definitely can't give you a high five right now, mate. A little later, though. You'll maybe be bored, so I'm going to show you How Dad's video in three, two, one. Once complete, we could then get the boat back onto the trailer, and it was then time to tackle the installation of the new motor. So, my dad and I had previously removed the old outboard before the boat sat outside for many years. But when we removed the old one, we realised at that time that the new outboard was too big, and by too big I mean it was too long for the boat. So, it would turn out that apparently you can have a long leg or a short leg version of the exact same outboard. That would have been handy for me to know. But this is to allow for boats that have a low or a high transom, which is the back part of the boat. Now, you might think you could, but you can't actually put an outboard that's too long on a boat that's too short because this anti-cavitation plate has to be the exact right height for the engine to work properly. Now, at first I thought, no worries, because it looks like there's actually an extension in here, and if playing with Lego as a kid has taught me anything, this could possibly be removed and then Legoed back together without the extra Lego block, or even have that extra Lego block removed and replaced with four Lego Man heads. It turns out that this is the case, but finding these parts is near impossible. But with every problem, there's also an opportunity. We set the boat on fire, keep us warm through the winter months. But Dad's idea was better, which was to raise the height of the transom. So the first thing we did was work out the height difference, which was one Lego man head. To fill the core of the new transom extension and add additional strength, I used Jarrah, which is a West Australian hardwood. It's heavier than ply, but it's also quite resistant to rot, and it's what I had on hand. So then there was just lots of cutting and planing to get the shape right to get it to fit in. To engage the wood into the existing back of the boat, I bored some deep holes as far as I could and ran some thick stainless steel rods through. Now just building a Jenga tower on the back of the boat obviously isn't strong enough, so Dad had an aluminium bracket made up which would completely encase the extension and add a lot of strength. I then did some other finishing up touches to the back of the boat, like sealing the hell out of everything, and then sealed and reinstalled these marlin boards, if they are actually called that. It's what I've always called them, but now I've found other names online like swim boards, swim platforms, duck boards, boarding platforms. So I don't know, maybe we'll just go with a new name. Boat ass flaps. I then added some scupper valves to the splash well. I didn't even know these things existed, but basically they're a valve that lets a lot of water run out, but doesn't let any water come back in. With all that done, it was time to get the aluminium bracket on to add some decent strength to it all. It didn't actually go on this easy. Prior to painting it, there was a lot of bending and filing and adjusting, but we got there in the end. It was then bolted up with heaps of stainless steel fasteners and then sealed up. Then on the inside, there was a lot more fiberglassing for strength, and then I did a nice white flow coat just to finish it off, but also to make it obvious in the future if there were any signs of stress or cracks in the back end. So, this new engine is 90 horsepower, the engine we had on there before is 80 horsepower, and I think originally it had something smaller again. But with more engine on a small boat, I wanted to add in as much additional strength wherever I could. Although we have done that with the new bracket, part of me still wasn't satisfied because when doing my original research on transom modifications and engine upgrades, I found a lot of scary nightmarish images of transoms completely failing on boats. Now a lot of these are from the back of boats that have rotted or not been well maintained, but it was still playing on my mind, so I wanted to go stronger. So my plan was to get a nice big aluminium brace from the top of the transom, straight down and anchor it to the floor. I cut the materials to size, however I can't weld Ali at home, so in the end I temporarily tacked and even hot glued it up with steel bolts and bits of old brackets from when I made the Pogo Stilt Crutch video. But all of this just to serve as temporary braces. 
If your kids ever need dental work, this is also cheap and effective for that as well. But then I took this mess to a mate who can weld aluminium. It was actually one of his first projects welding Ellie, and I reckon he did a pretty top notch job considering. I then got all the holes drilled for it. Now apparently the safest way to drill a hole is to always drill towards your wee wee hole. I then painted it, bolted it to the transom and screwed it to the floor. I also carefully sealed around the floor screws so no water would try and sneak in later on and try and do dodgy stuff like cause damage or rot or steal beers from my outside fridge. Then I just put a bit of plate over the remaining hole in the splash well just to make it look all nice and pretty. Overall for the reinforcement brace, I haven't actually seen it done like this before on a fiberglass boat, but I'm really happy with how it's turned out. The boat was then ready for its new outboard. The engine cover itself was looking pretty shabby, so I thought it was worth giving it a fresh coat of paint. My father-in-law did the prep, sanding an undercoat. I then managed to find a close match to the Yamaha blue-grey colour, so I then gave it a nice thick coat. I gave it a really light sanding to smooth out the shitness and then hit it with some thick coats of acrylic clear coat. And to finish it off, I gave it a polish once it had all dried. I wanted to achieve the best results as possible as this was a bit of a test for the possibility of repainting my own car in acrylic in the future. But overall, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out for acrylic paint that's out of a rattle can. Also on the engine, apart from the most important stuff like sparkly paint, I spent a fair few nights on the engine itself replacing parts, checking and replacing worn components, lubricating, all that boring engine stuff. But damn, that's a sparkly engine cover. It was then time to finally get the motor installed. Once the holes were drilled and some extra aluminium plates made up, it was pretty smooth sailing getting the motor mounted. I mean, there was part of me that imagined it would just fall off like the suction cup stuck to a car windscreen, but it stayed on. The rest of the rigging of the motor was pretty straightforward. Cutting holes, running wires, connecting the gear cable and the make boat go faster cable, and pretending to do stuff on the gauges under the dash so I didn't have to make dinner. The only real hiccup was finding that the steering cable had completely seized, but that's pretty standard on boats, that's how they sell more cables. And also finding out that new stuff was completely the wrong size, like the steering arm, which I then had to cut and bend to shape. The engine side of things was then finally complete, but before moving it out to test start the engine for the first time, it turned out that I'd got to that point in a project that everyone gets to with rebuilds, where you realise that there is a load of other things wrong that need attention. So in thinking about getting the boat back onto the trailer, I realised that the hook on the bow was loose and it turns out the backing wood block that supports it had completely rotted away to dust. But that wasn't the only nasty surprise. While I was up in the bow of the boat, I found a big f off crack. A crack to there. In the front. So that's where the water's getting in, it looks like. Bugger. So if I didn't fix this, more water would leak from the deck surface down into the hull, which is what had happened in the past when it was in storage. So I got to work grinding and sanding. Now, fiberglassing in a confined space like this is a shitty job. But luckily, the snorkel mask powered respirator that I made in another video was a lifesaver for this job. I honestly don't think I could have worked with the fumes in such a small space otherwise. It was a bit bulky having the hose run down my back, but it worked a treat, pumping a fresh air supply from outside the shed to my face holes with zero resin smell. I explain how it works here. But I'll put a link to that video in the description if you're interested. I ended up getting the crack fixed and sealed and the bow hook reinstalled and fiberglassed. Then with most of the important tasks on the boat complete, there was only one other thing integral to getting it out of the shed and wet, and that was the trailer. The trailer had been sitting in storage for so long, it had fallen out of license. To get it re-licensed, it meant it had to be brought up to scratch. So my dad got to work on the springs and U-bolts, while I went to work on the rollers, rust repairs and paint with my father-in-law. The original tail lights were busted, so I replaced them with a red bubble pack of constipation suppositories. Then just to add a little bit of damage protection to them, I cut up some old oven grill trays and then welded them around. Great choice of material because when you weld it, it smells like baked potatoes. With the trailer all shiny and new, it was time to get it inspected for licensing. And in making inquiries for this, I realised that the trailer hadn't actually fallen out of licence in the first place. But with the trailer done, we could then get the boat onto it and move it out of the shed and see if this engine would start for the first time in 10 years. We connected up the garden hose for cooling and the engine did a wee wee. 
It was finally time, so with the turn of the key and a little bit of throttle, nothing. We then remembered that it runs on petrol rather than water and enthusiasm. The dads hooked that up and then poked around at things for a bit. It was then time to give it another go. I was pretty stoked that it actually worked. It actually started with no hassles. So then it was beers, which is a little tradition Australians tend to do when they reach a goal like starting an engine for the first time or even just getting out of bed. However, it wasn't floating yet. So it was off to the boat ramp to find out whether we'd just built a boat or an artificial reef. I'm not gonna lie, I was a bit nervous about how it would go. A lot of work went into it and there was still that chance that the setup would be wrong in some way. Not necessarily something catastrophic, but just underperform or it needing a lot of extra work. So we pushed it off the trailer and it actually floated. There were no leaks, also a good feature to have in a boat. And with that, we were off. It ran beautifully. We appeared to have a functioning boat again. There were a lot of small adjustments I had to make, but nothing major luckily. It sits a little bit lower in the water than before, maybe three or four centimetres, but the transom is a lot higher now. But it does sit within the engine's rigging specifications, which is great. Performance wise, I'm really happy with it, especially compared to when I had to walk it like a dog everywhere before. But I think the thing I'm most happy with is simply being able to get my family back out on the water. I spent a lot of time boating as a kid and now having my kids be able to experience the same thing, even in the same location that I did as a kid is just awesome. At the end of the day, it took a long time to get it back up and running, but there was a lot of stuff I learned along the way that I reckon I'll be able to apply to other projects in the future. And yeah, it's an old vessel, but you don't need something fancy to get a lot of living out of it. All in all, I would definitely say I'm getting a lot more out than I put in, but that's mostly in the form of fiberglass splinters. Yeah, boats. Thank you everyone for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry, it's been a while since I've posted a video. There was just a lot going on towards the end of last year. You may have also noticed that I've finally got a logo and some branding starting to happen for the channel. So it may be easier to recognize videos from my channel, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. I'm Craigo Turner, YouTube channel is Turner81, and I'll catch you guys next time.